I want to ask you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 17. Folks, we are, we are getting back into the message series through the Gospel of Matthew. And uh, we're beginning the installments again. We had about two years where we spent in the Gospel of Matthew. We took a break last fall, but we're jumping back in, and we're going to march through the rest of this year, finishing out the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to be looking in verses 22, 23 of the Gospel of Matthew. And uh, I want to talk to you today about the plan, God's plan, God's eternal plan of redemption and the story of that plan. You know, it's really important that we get stories right. You know how bad it can become when you get stories wrong, right? Like you guys remember the story of the landing of the moon. You know, this guy named Gene Armstrong, who on April 17th, 1977, walked down the ladder from the Apollo 13. He put his foot on the moon. He said, this may be one big step for man, but it's one little step for mankind. (laughs) No, (laughs) that's not the story. I hope you know enough history to know that I had just butchered the whole story, right? That's not the story. Here's my point. It's really important to get the story right. Because the story wrong changes everything. And we've got to get the gospel story right. Because eternity is at stake. And we can live our lives in such a way where we might twist the gospel, make it into a version that's more palatable for us and more convenient for us, and yet even deceive ourselves about what it means. And we don't want that. And we want to be people of the gospel who share the pure, simple gospel of Christ with others. So here in Matthew chapter 17, Jesus is sharing the prediction of his death, burial, and resurrection. Now, three times in the gospel he does this. This is the second time that he foretells his death and resurrection, which, by the way, helps us understand that Jesus knew the reason for which he was born. And he came back to that goal And that achievement, time and time again, he was not going to compromise it. He was not going to be diverted or distracted away from it. He knew the reason that he was born. He's telling the disciples that soon he's going to go away. He's going to be uh, executed. He's going to be crucified, but he's going to be raised again. So let's look at what it says. Verse 22 and 23. As they, that's Jesus and the disciples, were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. And they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. And they, that's the disciples, were greatly distressed. Other translations say that they grieved greatly. And you can imagine that they would, right? They had left everything to follow Christ, and yet he was saying, listen, there's coming a time when I'm going to die and when I'm going to go away. And so this is really important. Jesus, in this explanation, in foretelling his death and resurrection, is giving us the clear plan of God's redemption, God's way of bringing about our reconciliation to him. It is the gospel message. And I want you today to walk away having no doubt about what the gospel is, because the gospel is a phrase that we use a lot in churches. But maybe there are some in the room who really don't understand at its heart what it is. I want you to know exactly what it is. And the way that we're going to know exactly what it is is by first understanding what it's not. All right? Now, here's what the gospel is not. The gospel, first of all, is not self-help. It's not self-help. It's not to prop up a better version of the life that you want to live. It's exchanging your life for Christ's. The gospel is not (laughs) self-optimization. It's not maximizing ourself. It is dying to self. It is not a motivational story just so you can become a better you, so you can have positive relationships and self-esteem and professional success. A better you, of course, is a byproduct of the gospel, but the gospel is not needed because we need a little bit of wisdom so that we can win at life. It is needed because we are desperately lost, lost beyond measure, and we need a Savior And it's a long trip from the self-help gospel to the sacrificial model and message of Jesus who told his disciples, if you want to save your life, you must lose it. That's the gospel. We have examples of this, of Christians who have given themselves for the sake of the gospel in very sacrificial ways, even to the point of death. It is a calling to self-sacrifice and it's a calling to follow Christ. You see, the problem with the self-help gospel is that it expects nothing from us by promising everything for us. And that makes us the sinner, not Christ, which ultimately leads 
to a great amount of unfulfillment. So it's not self-help. Next, it's not a system to follow. I told you this before. The gospel is not a code of moral conduct. It's not an example of the life that we're to live in order to be right with God. We can never earn rightness with God. We can never measure up. We have all sinned and fallen short. But people think the gospel is kind of a value system, you know, a way to live like Jesus, who was nice. So we've got to be nice like Jesus. You know, he walked around. Jesus was nice. <laughs> he walked around with a lamb on his shoulder. You've seen those pictures? Why does he always have a lamb on his shoulder? I don't, I don't know why, why that. It's, you know, long flowing hair like a model in a magazine, pretty tender hands that never did a day of work, that kind of That's not Jesus. <laughs> and people think, well, the gospel is about me being nice and just being nice to everybody just like Jesus did. That's a value system. That's a rule. That's a rule-keeping kind of gospel. It's a gospel of do's and don'ts, keeping a bunch of rules. The gospel is not keeping a bunch of rules. It is a relationship with a loving and living Christ. Finally, the gospel is not a religious fable. It's not a nice little story to tell our children. The gospel is rooted in history. It happened in the first century. Jesus was very public. His teaching was very public. His crucifixion was public. His resurrection was public. It was not tucked away in some little corner back alley. Jesus is a historical figure. There were eyewitnesses to the accounts of his crucifixion and resurrection. There are historians that talk about the validity, the historicity of who Jesus was and what he did. It is rooted in history and grounded in history. The Apostle Paul was trying to explain that, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verses 3 through 4, this is what he says. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received. That Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. There is the gospel, folks. If you want to know what it is, that's it. It is Christ died, was buried, and was raised to life again. That's the gospel message. And Paul said that occurred according to the scripture. Hundreds of prophecies. We're going to look at some of them in a little bit. Hundreds of prophecies that predicted Christ's birth, the way that he would live his life, his crucifixion, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And then Paul would go on to say, not only is it according to the scriptures, but in 1 Corinthians 15, he would talk about the eyewitnesses. He would say that this resurrected Christ, the physical bodily resurrection of Christ, Christ appeared first of all to Peter, the apostle Peter. Then he appeared to more than 500 people all at once. Then he appeared to the Apostle James, Jesus' half-brother. And then Paul would say, listen, he also appeared to me. Paul would say, I saw the resurrected Christ. It's not a phantom. It wasn't a ghost. It wasn't an illusion. It wasn't a hallucination. It happened in history. It's not just a nice little fable. It's a historical reality. That's what the gospel is not. Now let's go back to Matthew chapter 17. There are key phrases that Jesus uses in Matthew 17, 22 through 23, that really unveil the heart of the gospel. Let's look at those key phrases. First of all, he says, the Son of Man. Now he is referring to himself. Jesus referred to himself as the Son of Man many, many times throughout the gospel. And the Jews who were in that crowd would know exactly what Jesus was talking about. He was talking about himself being the Messiah. It is a reference back to Daniel chapter 7, that great prophecy. When the ancient of days, the son of man that Daniel uses, that's the phrase that Daniel uses in Daniel 7, the prophecy that one day he would rule and reign on this earth. And when Jesus referred to himself as the Son of Man, he was proclaiming the fact that he was Messiah. Everybody knew there what he was saying. You cannot take his uniqueness, this fact, away from the gospel. He is the unique Son of God, not a Son of God, the unique, the only Son of God that God sent for our redemption and for our salvation. Uniquely, unlike anyone else, as Savior. No other religious leader throughout history made the claim of being God in the flesh. Jesus did. 
in all of his life gave evidence to the fact that what he said was true. He was God in the flesh. He was not just a nice guy. He was not just a moral teacher. He was not just a good guy who died for others. It would be nice for someone to die for another person, right? For a nice guy to die for people. That would be nice, but it would not affect our redemption. (laughs) Only the Son of God dying for us would cause us to be redeemed by God and reconciled unto him. The Son of Man, the unique Son of God. Next, he would say, the Son of Man will be delivered into the hands of men. This is about his arrest and betrayal, both of which were prophesied in Psalm 41 and Zechariah 11. Both of these prophecies have to do with betrayal of the Son of God into the hands of men so that he would be executed. Zechariah 11 talks about the literal 30 pieces of silver. Hundreds of years before Judas would be bought off with 30 pieces of silver, it was prophesied in Zechariah 11 that that would take place. He was betrayed. He was handed over to die by those who should have received him. Next, Jesus said, and they will kill him. They will kill him. This again was prophesied in Isaiah 53, that beautiful passage. You've read it before. Easter time, Christmas time. The beautiful passage of the suffering servant. Details about how the Messiah would die. Details about the crucifixion of Christ, of Messiah, is contained in Isaiah 53, all about his death. So you go, you know, just like me, you go, well, why? Why did Jesus have to die? I mean, God is God. God can do anything. Couldn't he come up with a different plan than that? Well, let's, let's talk about that for a second. How does this work? Why would Jesus have to die? There are two immutable, eternal characteristics of God. On one hand, God is love. The Bible tells us it's clearly God is love. But on the other hand, God is holy. And God is just. God is perfect. So on one hand, God loves us and he doesn't want to punish us for our sin. But on the other hand, he is just. And because he is just and holy, he must punish us for our sin. Otherwise, he wouldn't be just. He wouldn't be fair. He wouldn't be holy. In light of that, we are trying to relate to God. We are trying to have a relationship with him, but we are sinners. We can never earn or or deserve our way to God. The Bible says all have fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says all of us like sheep have gone astray. Not a single one of us could earn or deserve our way into heaven. Not a single one of us could save ourselves. We tend to, and I know why, but we tend to overestimate our goodness and underestimate our sin. (laughs) And I know that's kind of a bummer message, but this is where the good news comes into play. Think about it this way. Let's say you were a really good person and you only sin three times a day. (laughs) That'd be pretty good. I'd take that, right? Only three times a day, I said a bad word, had a rotten attitude, had a bad thought. Only three times a day, I'd be practically a walking angel. (laughs) But by the end of a year, I would have committed over 1,000 sins. And if I lived to be the average age of 70 in my life, I would have committed over 70,000 sins. Now, let me ask you, what's a traffic court judge going to do if you walk into his traffic court with 70,000 traffic tickets? He's going to throw you in jail. He's going to throw away the key. God is much more holy, much more fair, much more just than any earthly judge. So on one hand, he loves us, doesn't want to punish us. On the other hand, he is just and he must. This is a dilemma. God solved that dilemma in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus, as I've said, was the unique son of God. But what he did is so important. He refers to it here. He died on the cross in our place for our sin. Though I am guilty and could never earn or deserve heaven, ever earn or deserve a relationship with a holy and perfect God. Christ has paid the price so that I might enjoy that relationship with God. Let me illustrate it like this. Let's say that this book, this is a Bible, by the way, but let's say uh, it's just a book, but it's a book 
that is a record of every one of my sins. It'd be a lot bigger than this, by the way. Every one of my sins are recorded in this book. This is me. This is God. What is it that stands in the way and separates me from God? My sin. The Bible says that God sent Jesus Christ, his one and only son whom he loved, from heaven to earth to die on the cross. And Isaiah, all we like sheep have gone away. Every one of us have gone to our own way. We've turned to our own way, but God has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He bore my sin. He took my place. He paid the price for my sin. So now I can be reconciled to God. Go back to that courtroom. There I am before the judge. And the judge says, Mike, you are guilty. (laughs) In fact, so guilty that you're worthy of death. And he's just about to slam that gavel onto his desk and pronounce my sentence. And a hand goes up in the back of the room. And it's Jesus. And he says, Judge, I'll take his place. I'll die for him. What he deserves, place upon me. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing that God did. And he did it with his only son. I have two boys. I love them. I would lay down in traffic for them. I love them so much that I would never give them for you. (laughs) Because I don't love you that much. God must have loved us a whole lot that he would send his son for us. The Apostle Paul said it beautifully. We sang it a few moments ago. 2 Corinthians 5. He said, God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. Jesus lived a perfect, sinless life. He was innocent. I was guilty. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's the importance of Jesus' death. And the cross stands at the centerpiece of history. It is pivotal. What will you do with what God did for you? The story doesn't end there. Jesus goes on to say at the end, And he, that is the Son of Man, will be raised on the third day. There's prophecy in the Old Testament about Jesus' resurrection. He conquered death. His physical bodily resurrection occurred on that Sunday morning. He died. He was buried in the tomb. And that Sunday morning, he was raised to power in life. And he conquered death. And he conquered sin by his life. And because he conquered sin and death, he now imparts that same power to me by him, through him, because of him. I am able to have life eternal and a power for living now because his spirit dwells within me. That is such good news. That's what the gospel means, right? Gospel means good news. That is great news. It's the best news in the world. And here's the result. Three things real quickly. The result for those who place their trust in Christ as Savior, I'm forgiven. Romans 4 Paul says, Jesus was delivered over to, our death, over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. I don't know if you've been a Christian so long that you've forgotten what it was like to be cleansed and forgiven of your sin. I remember that amazing washing of my soul that occurred when I bowed my knees and gave my life to Jesus. And I cried out, I need a Savior, and I need you to forgive me. That is such a powerful transaction. And it's it's something that leads to the second thing. It sets us free. Not only am I forgiven, but I'm free. 
So my sins, past, present, and future, have all been forgiven. And because of that, I'm free. Nicole, in the video, talked about the bondage that she felt to guilt and shame. How she lived for years in the bondage of guilt and sin and shame. And then she found Christ and how that, that washed her and set her free. Paul would say in Romans 8, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. <laughs> set free from guilt and shame. Set free from the penalty and even the power of sin. Set free to live the life that God has for me. I'm free to follow him, to live for an audience of one. Free to do as he wants with the promise that he will provide. Which leads to the last thing. I'm forgiven, I'm free, but I am secure forever. This is like icing on the cake. If it wasn't enough to be free and forgiven, I am secure forever. My future is guaranteed. Heaven will be my home when I die. I will spend eternity in the presence of God, in the presence of other believers. What a great promise that is. Jesus said in John chapter 10, I give them eternal life. They will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. John 3, 16, God so loved the world, he gave his only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life life. Those who have trusted Christ as Savior will live in eternity with Him. And that never goes away. Never, ever goes away. We can never lose it because we never earned it. I love what John MacArthur said. He's a pastor and theologian. He says, if we could lose our salvation, we would, <laughs> which is so true <laughs> because we sin. We can't, we can't, we can't make it happen. But thank God it's not dependent upon me. It's dependent upon what Christ already did and my trust in him as my Savior. So that leaves us with two questions today, okay? Two pretty simple but kind of penetrating questions. I want to ask them to you. Question number one, if you were to die today, do you know for certain that you have eternal life? You can. The Apostle John would say in 1 John chapter 5, he said, these things have been written that you may know that you have eternal life. Not wonder, not hope, not guess, but that you may know that you have eternal life. Do you know? And second question is this. Let's say sadly, tragically, you were to die today. If you were to die today and you were to stand before God and he were to say to you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? Would you say, well, I've just tried to be nice like Jesus. I've tried to keep the Ten Commandments. I tried to be a good moral person. I tried to do a lot more good than bad. Or would you say, I don't deserve to get into your heaven. But because I've trusted Christ as my Savior, I can come, not based upon what I do or have done, but based upon what Jesus did for me. So I want to do this today. Let's bow in prayer. Your heads bowed and eyes closed. I want you to reflect upon those two questions. If you were to die today, do you know that you'd go to heaven? If you're, if you're doubting whether or not you would, it may be because of the way you've tried to get there. Maybe you've been placing your trust in yourself to get there. And God's message to you today is to transfer your trust from yourself to Him. And if today you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, I want to give you an opportunity to do just that. I want to give you an opportunity to allow Christ to forgive you of your sin and to come into your life. 
If you'd like to do that, I want to ask you just to repeat a prayer with me silently under your breath, just between you and God. I'm going to say portions of a prayer, a phrase at a time, and I want you to repeat those. It's not a formula. God is listening at the attitude of your heart. It's you giving your heart, your life to Christ. So pray this prayer, Father in heaven. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for my sin. I'm a sinner, God. I've done so many things wrong. Please forgive me. Please make me clean. Please come into my life. I place my trust not in myself to save me, but I place my trust in Jesus. I believe in who he is, and I trust in what he did when he died for me in my place. Make me new. Come into my life. And one day when I die, take me home to be with you in heaven forever and ever. If you prayed that prayer today, the Bible says that you've become a new creation. You've been born again. You've become a Christian on this day. And your life is new. And just like a newborn baby, you need nourishment and encouragement and care. You need to grow and develop. So I encourage you to let someone know, someone who'd be happy to know. Find a Bible teaching church. Get involved in prayer and Bible studies. Develop your relationship with Christ. It's one that will last forever. And for the rest of us, let this be um, a sober reminder of the simple and profound truth of what God did for us. That we may relish it and walk in it, so thankful for the gospel and for Jesus but that also we would be people of the gospel, that we would be people who would share the gospel with this world that desperately needs it. There are people in your world who need Christ. That we might shine that light, the gospel, to others. So, Father, thank you again for your plan, your ingenious plan that was born in eternity for our redemption. Thank you, thank you, praise you that you would offer your son in our place. And I pray, Father, that we would worship you and walk in you and share you and that kind of love with others. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.